do one more. I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. Come on. It's all about you. Do you mean it this morning? here this morning it's about you God it's not about me it's not about us this morning it's about you we come to meet with you and to celebrate you this morning it's all about you Jesus it's all about you Jesus come on tell me Verse 5 says this. The women were breathless and terrified until the angel said to them, there's no reason to be afraid. So some backstory: We know that Jesus uh, was crucified and he was buried. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with some relatives and friends, some ladies went to check on Jesus and they were going to tend to the body of Jesus. But when they got there, they saw an angel and the stone and the grave was empty. It says, there's no reason to be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus. Somebody say, I know you're looking for Jesus. It says, who was crucified, but he is not here. He has risen victoriously somebody say that word just as he said come inside the tomb and see the place where our Lord was lying would you pray with me this morning father in the name of Jesus we thank you for your word God we thank you that your word is alive and well and speaks truth to us today God I pray that you will speak directly to our spirits this morning God and that you will truly bring change to our lives. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. So some things that I want to pull out of this scripture to begin with is that these women went looking for Jesus. 
And I think many times when we come to church, we don't come to church looking for Jesus. Is that, is that the truth? Sometimes we come to church just because it's Sunday morning. Sometimes we come to church because there's nothing better to do. Sometimes we come to church because it makes us feel better. But really, I think a question that we can ask ourselves this morning is when we come into the house of God, are we coming looking for Jesus? Are we coming to have an encounter with him? Because the truth of the matter is, is you brought him with you to this place this morning. We've been talking for the last month about how our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we truly brought God with us, but there is power in the searching. There's power in the seeking because the word says, if you seek me, you will find me. Can somebody say amen? But do you know that the scripture doesn't end there? It says, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. Some of us are seeking God in our lives, but we're not seeking him with all of our heart. God, I want you more than I want anything else in this world. I want you more than the bacon and eggs and biscuits that the ladies cooked this morning. I want you more than the lunch that I'm going to have here in about an hour. I want you more than the next breath that I breathe. I want you more. The Bible says you will find him if you seek him with all your heart. I think many times we spend more time, more money, and more attention seeking the things of this world than we do seeking the face of God. But God's saying, I want a shift to happen in the church. I want something to change in the church to where his presence once again becomes priority in our life. Do you know that this was a dangerous time for Mary to be going and visiting the tomb? It was so dangerous that they had to station guards at the tomb to make sure that no one stole the body of Jesus. Listen, I'm telling you that this was a dangerous time for these women to go to the grave by themselves. But these women said, I don't care how dangerous it is. I don't care what I'm risking. I don't care what I'm putting aside. Listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shove everything to the side this morning. And I'm going to go find the body of Jesus. And you know what? They were not going to Jesus for what they could get. But they were going for what they could give. They were going to minister to the body of Jesus even though he was dead. They were going, even though it seemed like the story was over, they said, I'm going to go minister. Listen, that is what we come to church for even today. We don't come so much for what we can get. We come to the house of God. Listen, things will change in your life if you will shift your focus from what I can get to what I can give. Listen, your worship will go to a new level. The worship in this house corporately will go to a new level. If we can shift our focus instead of saying, okay, God, I'm here today. I came. Now you bless me. Now I think you should expect a blessing because anytime you get in the presence of God, things change. But if we can shift our focus instead of saying, God, what can you do for me? And we come into worship. Worship is not about you anyway. Worship is about the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe, lifting him high and exalting his name. That's what worship is about, is worship is elevating God in our lives. And so if we can come to church and say, you know what? I'm coming to worship my God. I'm coming to praise him. I'm coming to lift up his name. It's not about the songs they're singing. Listen, we we, we didn't sing but what two songs that we had planned for today. Everything else was uh, unplanned. The band was not ready, but I think they did a fantastic job. Can we give them a hand this morning? But it's about what we can give to God. I think that because we live... And you've heard me throw this out a few times here lately, but I think it's so serious in the church culture that we live in today that we live in such an idealistic society that church has become all about us, what we need, what we want, what we expect, what the church has to offer me, and less about what the church has to offer God. 
Because how many knows it's a two-way relationship? It's a two-way relationship. Can somebody say amen? So the women went looking for Jesus who was crucified. But it said, he isn't here. He has risen victoriously. And so as I was praying about this message, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said that there are some of you that are in a, it's almost like a life and death situation. Some of you this morning, are, it seems like you've been in a tomb. It seems like you've been in the grave. It seems like, but, but I believe that God by the end of this month is about to raise you up. But he's not just going to raise you up above your circumstance or your situation. He's going to raise you up victoriously. And I believe some things that have been whipping your butt for too long, God is about to cause you to raise up victoriously. Can somebody say amen? Sometimes the devil comes and he beats on God's people just like he did Job. But how many of you know that Job one day rose up victoriously and God blessed him with twice of what he ever experienced or had in his life. I believe that that's the way God's going to do it. The enemy's been stealing from some of you. The enemy has been manipulating some of you. The enemy has been intimidating some of you. But I believe that there is a time coming and a time coming soon where you are about to to rise victoriously. Can somebody say amen? It's when things seem hopeless that God has positioned you to be able to rise victoriously so that he can receive all the glory. Can somebody say amen? So these are some things that I believe that God is going to do this month. So this morning we're going to begin the series with a message entitled, Honored in Death. Honored in Death. In order for there to be a resurrection, there has to be a crucifixion. In order for things to come alive in your life, that means that at some point things have to die in your life. And, and you've heard me say this before, that revival is not for the healthy in order to revive something, something has to have lost its life. And so my prayer, now this, this may seem crazy, but my prayer is for our church not to need revival because we're alive and healthy and well. I, I think we got things mixed up sometimes because, because we say, God, you know, I just want to experience revival. But really, when God sends revival, it's really not for you that are praying and seeking the presence of God. It's for those who don't know the presence of God, those who need to be brought to life, those that once knew God, but they've fallen away. And so at some point, in order for things to be revived or resurrected, things have to die. And I can tell you this this morning, and, and this isn't part of my sermon, but I felt it strong this morning that there are some things in our lives as the church that it is about time that they be put to death so that the things of God can come to life. When Jesus died on the cross, he did not die with his sins. He died with the sins of you and me. He took on the sins of the world and he nailed them to the cross so that when he rose from the dead, the same death and burial that same death and burial would become the prepping ground for the resurrection and so if we can allow some things to die in our life God can begin to resurrect new life his life within us a life that is full of the fruits of the spirit and a life that will bear fruit that will last for all eternity and that's what we want for the church. We're going to talk about honored in death because Jesus was not just honored in his life. He was even honored in his death. And so John 19, 38 through 42. John 19, 38 through 42 says this. After this, this being when Jesus had died on the cross, last month we talked about how the veil was torn and how we have access into the presence of God when Jesus died on the cross. But after he died on the cross, Joseph from the city of Ramah, not, not his father Joseph, but another Joseph, <clears throat> who was a, listen to this, who is a secret disciple. 
of Jesus for fear of the Jewish authorities. Now I thought that's, why would it include that? This guy's a secret disciple of Christ because he was afraid of the authorities. And now this man is about to provide a tomb, a burial place, a place for the body of Jesus to lay that we're going to celebrate here in a couple of weeks. The same tomb that Jesus rose from the dead in. That same grave was provided by one who was a secret disciple of Christ. But can I tell you that at some point, the secret disciple of Christ is going to have to step out and be bold and to make a request and to make himself known as a follower of Jesus. I believe that some people are following Jesus on the fringes over on the side, they're following from a distance. They're following Christ from a distance, but at some point, you've got to make yourself known, and you've got to make your testimony known. And so this man eventually becomes uh, someone who is out in the open and someone who is bold in their faith. It says, for fear of the Jewish authorities, he asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus. So Pilate granted him permission to remove his body from the cross. In verse 39 it says, Now Nicodemus, who had once come to Jesus privately at night, accompanied Joseph. And together they carried a significant amount of myrrh and aloes to the cross. Then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it in strips of linen with the embalming spices according to the Jewish burial customs and near the place where Jesus was crucified was a garden and in the garden there was a new tomb where no one had yet been laid to rest and because the Sabbath was approaching the tomb was nearby and that's where they laid the body of Jesus so here's some facts about the burial of Jesus that will set the foundation for today's message. Number one, Joseph was part of the high council. This is not just some average dude. This is a guy that's part of the high council, part of the leadership of the Jewish people. He is the one who went and requested the body of Jesus. Number two, Jesus, I'm sorry, Joseph took a risk by asking for the body of Jesus. Remember, the religious leaders are afraid that there's a plot to to steal the body of Jesus and to do these things and to fake the resurrection and all of these different things. And so Joseph took a risk being part of the high council in asking for the body of Jesus. Number three, Joseph was a rich man and his tomb was very expensive. This wasn't just some average tomb. This was a tomb that he had purchased to be buried in honor. He is a person of honor. He's a person of authority, person of the high council. He's very rich, and his tomb is inside of a garden, and uh, and it's a tomb that had never been used before. Number four, the perfume and the ointment and the cloth were all very costly. We know that just one jar of the ointment and the perfume was worth a year's wages and so we have to understand that this was a very costly sacrifice that is being used on the body of Jesus and number five those who loved him brought extra spices and perfumes Remember, this is what the ladies were doing. They were coming to bring extra, extra things to minister to the body of Jesus. Somebody say he was honored in death. He, he was put to death as a prisoner, but he was buried. He was buried as someone, a man of honor. And so I want us to do just a quick self-evaluation this morning in this message. And this will prepare us to receive from God throughout the rest of this month, I believe. But here's a self-evaluation that I want us to look at this morning. I think it's so appropriate that it was raining and hard to get here this morning. 
that you're here because I, I believe that shows your devotion to the house of God. Number one, have I given God a place of honor in my life? Have I given God a place of honor in my life? I want you to listen to this verse in Isaiah 66, verse 1. It says, this is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build for me? And where will my resting place be? Where will my resting place be? I believe God is asking us that this morning. He's saying, hey, I've got all the heavens and I've got all the earth, but that's not what I'm looking for today. I am looking for a resting place, a place of honor. And so can I ask you, is our life prepared as a resting place for God? Is my life prepared as a place of honor from God? Is the way I'm living my life a way that honors God? Or am I just giving Him what I got? Have I spent time, listen, whenever we have guests of honor come, even to this church, whenever we have guests of honor come, we spend some time, man. We make sure that the bushes are looking right. We make sure that the grounds are looking right. We come and make sure all the chairs are right because... They, we're honoring a man or woman of God who has seated in a place of honor in our life. Whenever we have guests of honor come to our house, we make sure that the floors are vacuumed and, and, and swept and, and mopped and, and dusted and all of these things. And uh, we make sure that everything looks good. And, and usually Pamela cooks something that smells and tastes real good. And we spend some time preparing our place to honor those in our life. But the question is, do we spend time preparing ourselves for the place of honor that God is looking for. Where's the place that I'm going to dwell? I, you know, I, I spend some time with people who are, who are successful and who, who, have, who have traveled the world and, and preached the gospel. and different. We spend some time with these people and these people... Whenever, whenever they go and stay at a place, they expect to stay at a place that's a place of honor. And, and it's not because they're snobby or because of anything. It's just that that's, that's just, but, but listen, I believe that God is saying, hey, I'm not looking for some old shack to, to dwell in. It may look like a shack at the beginning, but we have a purpose in preparing ourselves for a place of honor. Can somebody say amen? And, and so I'm trying to drive this point home because I believe that God's saying, look, look, don't get lazy in your faith. Don't get lazy in your pursuit of me. Prepare yourself. Listen, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are we preparing ourselves? Are we treating the Holy Spirit? At, listen, are we treating him as a guest of honor in our life? Or is he just... The, the dude that we accepted when we got saved and he's hanging around somewhere. Are we treating him as the guest of honor in our life? Does this make sense to you? Okay. I know it's going to be quiet for a little bit this morning. That's okay. We want to give God a place of honor in our life. Matthew 6, says this. But seek first. Somebody say first. His kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And so what God's saying is that, hey, if you will make me priority in your life, if you will spend your life like the women did at the grave, seeking me, seeking me out, looking for a place, looking for ways to accommodate me in your life, then I will add everything you desire and need in your life. I will make sure all that stuff's taken care of if you seek me first. If we become seekers, so, so here's the deal. One of the big movements that took place in the 90s and the early 2000s was the seeker-friendly movement, right? Does anybody remember that? Seeker-friendly movement. We want to do anything we can to make sure that uh, people are comfortable in our church. And, and so the, the theory was good, but however, principles uh, 
were changed in the process, standards were lowered, the gospel was watered down in the process, and, and now the church is paying the price for that, okay? But, but how about this? I want us to be a seeker-friendly church. I want to be a church that's friendly to people who are seeking the face of Jesus, I want us to be a place where people are comfortable when they're seeking the face of God. I want this to be a place where people say, man, that is a place where you can go and go after God. That's a place where you can seek God. That's a place where you can worship God. That's a place where you can find God in the altars. That's a place where you can be healed, where you can be set free, where your life can be changed forever. I want this place to be known as a place that seeks first the kingdom of God. I like lights. I like smoke. I like things to look professional. I like for things to sound professional professional I like to, for us to put our best foot forward but I can tell you this that the thing that we are seeking first at Unity Church is the presence of God because your life will never be changed by a colored light your life will never be changed by a talented speaker or a talented musician but your life will be forever changed in the presence of the almighty God and so we want to be known as a place that seeks his kingdom first we spend most of our time, God, what can we do to, to cause people to want to seek you more? What can we do to, to cause people to encounter you more? What can we do to make our services uh, in, a, in a way and to structure our services in a way where people will connect with you? What can we do? But that's what we want. We want you guys to be able to connect with God in ways that you never have before. Well, Pastor, what about, what about you, the tithe payers? What, what, what about what they want? We can't think about that. We have to think about what God wants. Because again, church is not for us. I sing songs all the time that I do not like. We play songs all the time that I'm like, I wish I would never have to play that song again. But you know what? We keep doing it because you connect with it. We, we, we sing it and your hands go up. And we're like, well, we'll have to do it again. We sing it, come to the altar. Oh, we're going to have to do that song again. Lyndall Cooley said this in the Browns of Revival. They had church on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then they went and had revivals on Monday and Tuesday. Seven nights a week they were having church. And almost every single night he had to sing the happy song. Or enemies camp. Or something like that. And he was like, man, if I hear the enemies camp one more time, I feel like I'm going to puke enemies camp all over the floor. I hate that song. He's like, I hate that song. But we do it because people are connecting with God. Because church is not about Lyndall Cooley or the pastor or the tithe payer or those who aren't paying their tithes. Church encounters are all about King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We seek him first. And everything else, you know what I found out? If we seek the presence of God, we make him priority in our life, tithe payers will come. If we seek him first and, 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 and make him priority in our life, then the professional things that we get to enjoy, they will come. Because he will add everything to us that we need for the journey. Everything we want, maybe not. Everything we need, absolutely. And you know what God will do? The closer you get to him, he begins to change your desires to match his desires. Because you become close to him. We want to be seekers and we want to create a place of honor in our lives. So here's a question you can ask yourself to put this down in a practical sense. Is God seated in a place of honor or have you stuck him over at the kids table? Now I've been in some places where I'd rather be at the kids table than, <laughs> than the adult table. They're having more fun over there like peas are flying and they're having a big time, right? I, every table you sit at at my house has got kids, so, you know, but, but seriously, have we given God a place of honor in our life or have we made him the, just the, the guest at the kids' table? You go sit over there. We don't have room for you at our, at our table. Now, what does that look like? Well, I got time for my friends. I got time for my job. I have time for my career, my hobbies. I have time for... Uh, my extracurricular activities. I have time for my kids' activities. And if I find time, I'll give it to you, God. That's what it looks like. And I'm just, listen, I'm looking at myself and I'm not preaching at you this morning. I'm, I'm hearing this with you because I want this to change my life as well. I want him to be, so, I want him, his, him to be seated in such honor in my life. 
that everything else has to wait on whatever God wants me to do. Society tells you you got to do this, you got you got to make this, you got to live in this, you got to uh, accomplish this, and and listen, all of that stuff will come if you seat him in a place of honor. Does that mean we become lazy and we stay home and, and we pray all day long and, and read our Bibles all day long? No, I don't think so because we would be unproductive, right? God called us to be co-laborers with Christ. God wants us to be active in our community and active in our lives. But here's the deal. If you're at a baseball game, is he seated in a place of honor? Or if you asked him to stay home until you get back? right? If you're at work, is he seated in a place of honor? If you're at school, is he seated in a place of honor? Or do you just wish that he could uh, put earplugs in so he doesn't hear what you have to say, right? God needs to be seated in a place of honor no matter what we're doing in life. Can somebody say amen? I can tell by your reactions I need to move on. <laughs> but here's the deal. God's a God of order and he is, will never, ever, ever be satisfied with second place. Ever. He will not, listen, if, if, if something is first place in your life, then it has become an idol that you now worship and you've given God the back seat. And so I know this is a hard message. I'm kind of glad that half of our folks stayed home this morning. But, but, but you get to endure but guess what? Your lives are the ones that are going to be forever changed if you can seat him in a place of honor. A place of honor. That's what he wants. That's what he's looking for. Where's the house? Look, look I've, I've got a throne and I've got a footstool, but I'm looking for a house where I can dwell, where I can be comfortable, where I can coexist with you in this life. That's what God's looking for. So, number one, have I given God a place of honor in my life? Number two, what do I have invested in him? I've given him a place of honor. And what do I have invested in him? So Joseph went and, and found a tomb that he owned that no one had ever laid in before in a garden, in a place of honor, a, a tomb meant for someone a part of the, as a part of the high council. He gave him a place of honor. But not only did he didn't stop there, he said, before we put him in the place of honor, we're going to make an investment in his life an investment even in his death and so before they laid him in the grave they began to make an investment with frankincense and myrrh and 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 alabaster jars and uh you know and 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 scents and different things perfumes things that were very costly fine linens that they wrapped around his body they made an investment and so the question is are we invested in christ Christ is invested in us, but are we invested in Christ? And I think for many of us this morning, we could say, yes, we have invested ourselves in Christ. But Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. God is not looking for your leftovers this morning. God is looking for an investment, something that costs you something, something that, look, not just, an, not just a tip offering, and I'm not just talking about money this morning. I'm talking about our life. Is our life fully invested? Are we giving him the best of our time? Are we giving him the best of our talents? Are we giving him the best of our treasures? Or is he getting the leftovers? God I never, ever will want your leftovers. I don't even, I don't like leftovers. Unless it's super chilly. You know, super chilly gets better as time goes on. But everything else, I don't enjoy eating leftovers. We do in my house because my wife is frugal. And so, or cheap. And uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. She's like, we're eating until it's gone. But baby, it's crusty. We're eating it until it's gone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can I tell you, when a guest of honor comes, you don't pull out the leftovers. You don't. Unless it's super chilly. All right? When a guest comes, you don't, a guest of honor comes, you don't pull out the leftovers. You might pull out the prime rib or the steak or lobster or shrimp or chicken and dumplings or 
turnip greens or uh, cornbread. Mm. I would say the bacon, but Pamela won't buy that either. We don't get bacon at our house. Okay. <laughs> don't you know that's pig's fat? Pig's fat should not cost so much. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Got to move on. Is anybody hungry? <laughs> as, Tim, as Tim kept saying on the men's trip, I'm committed now. I, uh, I don't know, some pork chops or some, uh, yeah, okay. Are we invested? I do. I'm convinced of this. And I, I feel like I can pretty safely say this because I'm guilty at times as your pastor. And I would pretty well bet that this is going to apply to everybody in this room. Sometimes God gets our leftovers. In fact, just so we can break this religious spirit in the room this morning, if God ever gets your leftovers, can you raise your hand in, the, in here? God gets your leftovers? If I have time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to squeeze in a Bible study. If I have time, I'm going to squeeze in, well, I didn't get to this morning, so on my way to work. Or, you know, if we, we, we try to fit him in our schedule when really God wants us to fit our schedule into him. Seek first the kingdom of God. God doesn't want your leftovers. He wants you to make an investment in the kingdom. Philippians, it's the first fruits. The best of what we have belongs to him. And I can, I can say this because it's Bible. If you're not tithing a tenth of your income, God's getting your leftovers. God will take the extra as an offering, as an investment, as a seed. But until you have tithed a tenth of your income, according to his word, right? How many knows that's the Bible? Our income as pastors of this church and staff does not change based on what you give. So I don't try to get you to give so that I can get. I try to get you to give so that you can be obedient to the word of God and you can begin to put the kingdom of God first in your life and God can begin to add all these things unto you. God wants you to invest in the kingdom and in his life and he wants you to make him first and foremost and until we do that not only is he not able to bless us but the Bible says that we're robbing him. Because the first fruits, the tenth of our income and the tenth of our increase belongs to him anyway. It's not even ours. He's just seeing if he can trust us. He, we want God bless me. God, I can't even trust you to give me what's mine. How am I going to bless you with more? Okay, I got to get off of it. Okay. It's so true though, man. It's so true. It's so true. I was so excited that we were able to give, again, give by the grace of God, not a tenth, but, but 20% of our income to the Lord. That's, that's the grace of God and not going to every movie we want to see and doing everything we want to do. That is the grace of God that we're able to do that. We don't try to get you to do something that we're not doing. We're, look, we're trying to set a high standard and an example. And because of that, God continually blesses our family over and over and over and over again. And so, and, and, and people that, that watch us and know us, they see it. There's no way Travis and Pamela should be able to do this. There's no way they should be able to afford that. But God makes a way where there is no way. Whenever you have sought first the kingdom of God, it has become the most important thing to me and my family to make a difference in the kingdom of God. And I'm not bragging on this. I'm just saying that's the way. You want prosperity? So into it. Invest into it. Let God know that he can trust you, at least with what belongs to him. It's all his anyway. He owns, he owns it all. He gives and he can take away. 
it all belongs to God anyway. And I know you didn't come here to get beat up on, but I, listen, I'm, 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 I'm taking the punches with you because, because God is wanting to position us into a place of prosperity in our life. God wants you to be prosperous. God wants to bless you. God wants you to have more than enough. But God, you, he has to position you into that place. And that happens when we are invested in the kingdom of God. That's where treasures are stored. They won't rust. They won't be eaten with the moths. They won't decay. They, they, they won't fade away. It's treasures that will last for all of eternity, which I love what, what they said this weekend at the, at the ramp. Eternity does not start when you breathe your last in this life. Eternity begins whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. How can we pray that? It's because now we're a part of that kingdom, uh, that eternal kingdom of God, whenever we make Jesus our Lord and Savior. Eternity begins when you say yes to Jesus. Are you invested in it? Philippians 3.8 says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider it all garbage that I may gain Christ. What Paul is saying here is he's saying, I've invested my entire life, my entire being to following Christ, to knowing God, to serving God. I've invested it all for his sake. And now that I have a taste and I've seen the, what God can do in my life. Well, now that I've tasted the kingdom of God and his presence and his life-changing power, everything else I count as garbage because of the worth that I've found just in knowing him. If God doesn't give you another thing, just knowing him is worth it. Just being a part of his kingdom. Listen, being the lowest position in the kingdom of God is better than being the highest person in slavery. It's better to be a doorkeeper in the house of my God. Be better, better to open the door for, 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 for th those things that come in and out of the kingdom of God. It's better to be that person than it is to be the highest in position in a place of slavery. God's wanting to bless you. He's wanting to prosper you. But you've got to be invested. And have we counted it all worth it? So really, what or who are you investing in? What or who are you investing in? What's getting your money? I mean, th this is practical. What's getting your money? The credit card companies? The banks? Okay, so this is, this is kind of a funny story. We went through financial peace last year, and one of the things that Dave Ramsey said, he said, it's never good when you walk in a bank and they get excited. Oh, there's Travis, all right? There's, there's Robert, there's, there's Jared, you know? Oh, and, the, and they get up and they start bringing you coffee and stuff like that. You know, that's never a good thing. Okay, so this, this is not, this is not, a story to to down myself but in the last month my mother-in-law us and my my mom all three of us sold our houses and bought houses so we had three transactions going on at the same bank at the same time and so I was always going and checking on things for them or checking on things for my mom making sure just is everything okay is there anything they need to do and all this stuff and we were making our our, our transaction and and so I was in there a lot over the last and so the other day I just went in I needed some copies made and a fax a fax sent off and uh, man everybody was coming over and talk because because I've become uh, uh, like a, a normal uh, visitor into the establishment not that I'm spending a lot of money or borrowing a lot of money from or anything it's just I was there a lot right and so so the other day I had that thought I was I walked out of the bank feeling kind of good, you know, because everybody was coming and talking to Travis and all this stuff. And I was, I was like, man, you know, that, that kind of felt good. And then immediately I remember what Dave Ramsey said. It's never a good thing. <laughs> Somebody just dropped some money, right? <laughs> so, or was about to drop some money. And so it just wasn't, 
it just wasn't all my money. And so I, the feeling faded really, really fast. I was like, you know, I probably need to stay out of there for a little while. What or who are you investing in? My youth pastor told us when I was a teenager, and this, this has stuck with me all through life, said, if you want to know who your God is, look at your checkbook. Some of us, that could be Walmart, right? Okay, I'm, I'm for real, I'm moving. I'm moving on, I'm moving on. What or who are we invested in? Okay, number three. I think that's to, to him telling me, come on, you got to move, son, you got to move. Am I willing to take risks on his behalf? Am I willing to take risks on his behalf? So one, have I given God a place of honor in my life? Two, what do I have invested in him? And number three, am I willing to take a risk on his behalf? John 19, 25 through 21 says this in closing, if the worship team would come. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, listen to this, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to his disciple, here is your mother. From the time, this time on, this disciple took her mother, uh, I'm sorry, took her into his home. And so here we have a man, one of the disciples of Christ, who has followed Jesus, who has pressed in close to Jesus, who has even followed him to the cross when all the other disciples scattered. All the other disciples ran for their lives. We have Peter over there denying that he ever knew Jesus. We have uh, Judas who, who had betrayed Jesus, who had hung himself. We've got the other disciples. We have no idea where they're at. But yet there's one disciple who is standing at the cross with the mother of Jesus. And he said, I am willing to risk my reputation. I am willing to risk my life. I am willing to risk it all I don't care what people say about me I don't care if they call me a holy roller I don't care if they they say that I think I'm better than them I don't care if they call me judgmental or a braggart or, or, or a bigot I don't care what people call me or what they think of me I don't care if if there's a church in town that is the popular place to go I'm gonna be a seeker and a follower of the face of God even if it takes me to the cross I, even if it takes me to Golgotha, even if it takes me to a place of shame, even if I lose everything, if they throw me in jail, if they beat me up, I don't care. I am going to faithfully follow Christ in every area of my life. I was just watching a video the other day. I was just watching a video the other day. Someone posted online and it's a video I'd seen a long time ago of the Brownsville Revival 2020 came and did they spent like a weekend with them down there uh, at the Revival 2020 doing a news story on the Revival the lives that were changed because of the Revival at that time the Revival was about two years old and I believe a couple of hundred thousand people had already given their hearts to Jesus. Right there in Pensacola, Florida, a little inner city church in Pensacola. And there was a, an assistant principal from Niceville uh, who began to bring students to the revival. And he began ministering to students and then these students lives were being changed drug addicts were set free from drugs kids who are 
uh, about to commit suicide were, were filled with the Holy Spirit and, and rejoicing and power. And all these lives have been changed from students all over the place. And man, God was doing a work in Niceville and, and students were praying for other students. And man, revival was coming to that school and everything else. And then a few parents from another denomination rose up and said, we don't want him taking kids. They weren't taking uh, their kids necessarily it was is we don't want them taking kids at all from the school to experience this revival he is in a place of authority he is a vice principal of the school and we want him removed from his position he was he he literally lost everything they brought him on trial they said that you're not allowed to, to to preach the gospel you're not allowed to share the gospel with students you're not allowed you shouldn't be even though it's not during school hours you can't be taking kids to to, to church services and uh and these kids lives are being changed that they actually the prosecutors actually said you're changing their life forever and you don't have the authority or the right to do that you're changing what they believe in forever and you don't have the authority or the right to do that and he lost everything. They fired him. They took his license away and all this stuff. And, and they, they transferred him to a position to where he would have no contact with children at all. And all these different things. And, uh, and the news lady interviewed him and said, what would you do different? If you knew the outcome, what would you do different? He said, if you were asking me if I would sacrifice my career, if I would sacrifice my everything that I've worked for, for any one of the lives that have been changed, I'm here to tell you today, I would not do a thing different. Why? Because he counted the cost and it was worth it. He knew in the beginning what it might cost him and he said, it's worth it for these teenagers to be come off drugs it is worth it for these teenagers to come it showed listen 2020 did an awesome job they showed the kids getting baptized and giving their testimonies of where they had come and where they are now i'm telling you that this man became a seeker of christ and he saw first the king he, he didn't he didn't care what his community thought he said i'm here for one reason and that's to glorify christ with my life and it drew the attention of 2020 news media because somebody in the church actually stood up and did what was right someone in the school system stood up and said i don't care what they do to me listen this this imitates the life of the early disciples they said we may get thrown in jail but we're preaching the gospel we may get beaten with stones, but we're preaching the gospel. We're giving it all to Christ because it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk. Can somebody say amen? Would you stand with me this morning? So the question is, what are we willing to risk for God? Are we willing to risk our reputation, our money, or even our convenience? We live in a society full of conveniences. And sometimes doing what God wants us to do is just not convenient. Can I tell you this? It's not convenient for us to send Pastor Quay and Michaela to Helena, West Helena. That's not convenient. As much as I love Mikey, we're going to have to raise up another youth pastor. Right? No offense, Mikey. It's just going to be new, you know? <laughs> it's, not con it's not convenient for us. Listen, here very soon, and I, I reposted what Brother Rod Boy said. He's, he's asking for people to commit a year, even from Magnolia. He's asking for people to pray and ask God if if. They would be willing to commit a year of their life in Helena, West Helena. That's not convenient. It's not convenient to set everything aside and, and do something like that. It's not convenient. But I can tell you this, that if you make the risk to invest yourself in the kingdom of God and what he's doing on the earth, then you will be receiving a return that is like no other. 
a return that is like no other a return that will reap benefits for all of eternity are you willing to make the risk of investing yourself in the kingdom of God can somebody say amen